People are fascinated by the idea of lost civilizations, from El Dorado to Atlantis. Most of the folklore tends to be supremely regal, with tales of roads paved in gold or advanced technology lost to time. This is not one of those stories, because it happens to be true. This is the story of the lost empire of Yam, and the journey of 300 asses and one dancing pygmy. Allow me to explain. Yam was a trading partner with the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt around 2300 BCE, and probably for quite some time before and after. There are two main reasons why Yam is so fascinating. The first is that nobody can agree on where it was actually located, despite the fact that it was rich enough to have an impact on the commerce of Egypt, and we have travel records from a merchant who visited Yam at least four times. The second is that the writings left by the aforementioned merchant are some of the most vivid and hilarious ancient Egyptian writings ever found. They are described by Egyptologist Margaret Alice Murray as perhaps the most interesting and human of all inscriptions from this period. The story begins in 1885 with the excavation of 17 tombs by an English war-slash-science party led by General Grenfell. One of those tombs belonged to a man named Harkouf, who is the hero of our story. His tomb was highly decorated with hieroglyphics. Unfortunately, the original copyists did such a terrible job of collating this text that it took several more years and a team of German translators before it could be deciphered completely. Egyptologist James Henry Breasted expressed his disappointment in his books, noting a missing character with, of course omitted by the copyist. Harkouf of course begins his inscription in the traditional ancient Egyptian way, first boasting about himself and then threatening intruders with a curse. He writes, I gave bread to the starving, a garment to he who was naked, I ferried him who had no boat. And then, as for any man who enters into this tomb, I shall seize him about the throat like a wild fowl. We'll come back to that. Then, unexpectedly, Harkouf tells a long story about his four journeys to the land of Yam, which get increasingly interesting as they progress. His first journey was with his father, and they made the trip in only seven months, which apparently was a big deal and impressed everybody back in Egypt. His second trip, without his father, was made in eight months. Harkouf would have us believe that it took longer because he took a slight detour to marvel at the countries he was passing through. More likely, his father wasn't there to help navigate around the camps of Egyptian enemies efficiently. See, the area to the south of Egypt was a political minefield, with shifting alliances. Harkouf might have been held up by threatening political tensions in a country called Urtjet. The third trip is where things got tricky for Harkouf. First, he decided to follow a different route to Yam, possibly to avoid Urtjet. And second, he gives no mention of how long the trip actually took, which might be because he was embarrassed by how slowed down he was by politics and an enormous donkey train. And when he eventually did make it to Yam, the chief he was supposed to be trading with was missing. Turns out he had ridden off with a war party to do battle with Yamite rivals to the west. Now, this wasn't like driving to Taco Bell and finding out their lobby is closed for the day due to a lack of staff. No, Harkouf had already been on the road for what was probably a third of a year, with not much but a conga line of asses for company. He couldn't return empty-handed. So, Harkouf decided to chase the chief down through hostile territory. Harkouf gives no account of this chase, but it probably wasn't as simple as just calling out the chieftain's name across the desert. Well, Harkouf eventually did find the ruler of Yam and it is written that he satisfied him. This is rather ambiguous, but Harkouf might well have us believe that he played a successful diplomat and calmed down the tensions between the war parties. Or it could mean that Harkouf successfully completed the trade negotiations and ignored the war. Or Harkouf may have taken advantage of the chief of Yam's plundering of weaker people, allowing him to sweeten the mercantile deal with ill-gotten goods. But however he did it, he did it very well, and returned from his trade with a caravan of 300 asses, laden with incense, ebony, hecnu oil, leopard skins, elephant tusks, throwing sticks, and all goodly produce. He also found himself escorted by a Yamite war party, probably as part of his negotiation. Now, one important side note. You might be wondering why Harkouf chose to lead a caravan of donkeys, instead of the logical choice, camels. Well, this is because camels hadn't actually been domesticated yet, and didn't exist as pack animals in the area at that time. Undoubtedly, the trip would have gone much smoother with dromedary-type transport, but Harkouf didn't have that option. Which was important, because it probably affected his choice of return route from his third journey. 
Because of the heavy load and the difficult donkeys, as well as the appealing use of the Nile River, he decided to return through the hostile country of Urtjet, instead of traveling through the safer yet harsher desert. And they were waiting for him. At some point before his third journey, three countries somewhere near the Nile River united under a single chief, which Harkuf calls the chief of Urtjet, Wawat, and Setju, all united in one. They probably intended to rob his asses blind, but they couldn't, under the watch of his extensive Yamite guard. Instead, the chief not only granted Harkuf safe passage through the territory, but even gave him gifts of animals to add to his convoy. Harkuf claims this was done because he was more excellent and vigilant than any caravan conductor who came before him. This diplomatic move, instead of a violent caravan raid or extorted taxes, eased tensions all around and helped make Harkuf even more of a legendary trader. His donkeys and later ships made it back to Egypt safely. Harkuf would return to Yam at least once more in his life. This time, instead of writing about the journey himself, he includes on the walls of his tomb a letter written by Pharaoh Pepi II, who was about eight years old at the time. Harkuf had promised to bring the pharaoh a dancing dwarf, that is, a pygmy from elsewhere in Africa that had been trained in exotic forms of dance. Pepi II writes in his letter that he cares more about this dwarf returning safely than he does about all of the other riches Harkuf had traded for. Pepi II promises Harkuf eternal rewards for the safe delivery of the pygmy. His majesty will make thy many excellent honors to be an ornament for the son of thy son forever. Pepi II also tells Harkuf to protect the pygmy whenever he gets into a boat or sleeps at night. When he goes down with thee into the vessel, appoint excellent people, who shall be beside him on each side of the vessel, take care lest he fall into the water. When he sleeps at night, appoint excellent people, who shall sleep beside him in his tent, inspect ten times a night. So proud was Harkuf of this letter that he had the writing space in his tomb expanded after completion to make room for it. By the way, you can find the full translation as well as pictures of the hieroglyphics in my reference section linked below. There are many versions of the translation because it was translated back and forth from many languages, and so I have included several of them. But now comes a bizarre problem. Where in the world was Yam? Considering we have accounts of travel time with geographical and political details, shouldn't we know? And yet, there are at least eight historically argued placements for this land of riches. Historians from many countries have debated Yam's size, distance from the Nile, and distance from Egypt since the first evidence of its existence was uncovered over a century ago. I have, for possibly the first time in history, mapped out eight of the most well-known location propositions to give you a better idea of how wide the speculation is. Unfortunately, it has been around 4,000 years since the last time Yam was mentioned. It's possible that it may remain a mystery forever. But I'm optimistic. What almost definitely happened was Yam was eventually absorbed into some other culture to the south of Egypt. Archaeologists are still working on old and new excavation sites in that area. It'll take a lot of digging, literally, but I think we'll eventually find it. But even as we stand now, we're lucky to know as much as we do about ancient life on the Nile thanks to the unusual record-keeping and monument-building of the ancient Egyptians. Speaking of record-keeping, on the same day that I read the curse in Harkuf's tomb, I came down with a bad cold. So I guess being seized about the throat like a wild fowl is a sore throat and a nasty cough. Maybe it was a coincidence. Or maybe the curse got weaker over time. But just in case, I will end this video with the traditional blessing that Harkuf left for his mourners. A thousand loaves, a thousand beers for that legendary merchant, Harkuf. That's actual wine. Okay. <laughs>